Today I'm going to be talking to you about some of the context in which literature from 1945 to now was written in. So really the focus of this presentation is going to be giving you some kind of background information on the history of 1945 to now so that you can then think about how context shapes literature. And what I mean by that is several things, really. Um, so really, this kind of literary theory um, argues that what is written in a piece of literature is directly affected by when it was written and who it was written by. And um, so just like our lives are shaped by the time that we live in um, who we are and kind of how that affects how other people treat us and the opportunities that we have. Um, people who view this kind of historicist view of literature would say, well, actually, um, you know, the reason Shakespeare's plays are like they are is because he was a man living in Tudor and Stuart, England. And so he was really shaped by the time he was written in and his sort of writing is really kind of mired in that context. And so we're going to be thinking about how literature that you read that might have been written in this time period reflects the time period it was written in but was also shaped by the kind of attitudes and the events that were happening while it was being written. So the big question is going to be really how did the world change between 1945 and now? I mean there are lots of different ways that it changed. I'm going to be taking you through some of the sort of big changes as I see them. But before I kind of begin that, a little bit of a caveat. We can't really tidily divide history into themes, and we also can't really divide people's lives into themes. And obviously, I'm going to be talking about kind of lived experiences of millions and millions of people. Um, so what I'm going to be presenting to you is one perspective on some of the things that were important during that time period and hopefully it will give you a good introduction to go and kind of learn more and read more and find out more about this time period um, but please don't think that you know this is what happened and these are the facts um, because I'm going to be telling you lots of facts but I'm also going to give you a kind of perspective and probably how we view you know, this time period from a 2020 perspective is going to be quite different to how someone might view it in 10, 50, 100 years time. Um, so just be aware that I've kind of put up all of these themes I'm talking about. But of course, there's going to be lots of links between these themes, too. But hopefully this is a good way of kind of starting to think about some of the main things that happened in this time period. So first of all, um, if we're thinking specifically about the UK, because obviously you mainly look at um, literature that was written by um, sort of British citizens. So that's what I'm going to be focusing most of this talk on. If we think about changes in population. So I'm sure lots of you have already kind of heard of um, the Windrush generation. There are lots of people from the Windrush generation who are still living in Hackney, as well as all sorts of places in the UK. Um, but this is when um, the Empire Windrush um, arrived in the UK in 1948, and it brought lots and lots of people from Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago to the UK. Now, it's really important to note that it wasn't the case kind of pre-1948 um, that we only had kind of um, white sort of Anglo-Saxon or European um, British citizens living in the UK. That certainly wasn't the case. But it is true that in the kind of decades following World War II, lots of people who lived in Commonwealth countries, so countries that were formerly part or at that point still part of the British Empire, um, moved to the UK and they moved for lots of different reasons. They moved for jobs, they moved to be with family and they moved for the kind of opportunities that they saw in the UK. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, um, there were lots of things that kind of the people who came faced and there's lots and lots of difficulties um, lots of racism on a kind of individual daily basis, but also in quite a sort of structural way that lots of organisations um, sort of stopped them joining or prevented them from getting jobs or renting houses and those sorts of things. So 
if we move to kind of the next date on the slide, 1965, um, the Reese Relations Act. And this is a really, really important bit of legislation that was brought in by the government, which made it illegal to discriminate against someone um, because of their race. So, for example, you couldn't do things like refuse a job. Um, refuse someone getting a job because of their race and um, this was a really kind of important part of law and there were lots of other um, laws that were passed in the 1960s and 1970s that were about stopping these kinds of discrimination and also things like the kind of sexism and um, that women might also face so you get lots of laws around this time period that were about enshrining some of the rights today that we might think well of course, of course, that's a right. But actually, this is something that happened quite recently. Now, I've put in 1987 that Diane Abbott was elected, obviously, MP um, for Hackney. Um, now, there were three other black MPs elected in this election. There had been um, black MPs before. We've actually had um, black MPs since 1920. Um, but this was the first female black MP. And I think really important that the kind of makeup of government was changing as well as kind of the makeup of society. Now, the other things going on in terms of the makeup of society. So I've put the EU flag, obviously something that kind of feels quite topical or certainly did um, kind of a year or two ago. The population of the UK also changed in terms of migration of people from Europe coming into the UK, and especially in the last sort of 20 years or so, or so, especially from Eastern Europe, but also from um, all of the countries in Europe too. So we've got people coming into the UK um, and the kind of makeup of the population changing in that way. There are also some other ways in which the population changed. So I've put this picture of um, some very sort of cute looking babies here. And um, that's because um, the birth rate has been declining in the UK over the last 75 years ago. So there are less children um, being born every year than there were um, 75 years or so ago. Um, that's for lots of reasons, um, but it's partly because less people are getting married, not that you need to be married to have children. Um, when people are getting married or are having children, they're having those children later in life, which might be a reason that they have um, fewer children than they would previously. So we've got a changing population that's getting older, that might be a lot more diverse um, and there are all sorts of things that kind of go along that in terms of people's attitudes in terms of you know what we might think a sort of quote-unquote British person looks like or what opinions they might have um, and lots and lots of really really good and positive progress has been made but I've also put here um, sort of the protests that obviously have been going on in the last month or so because it's not the case necessarily um, that racism doesn't exist in the UK today, or that all of that kind of immigration has gone 100% smoothly. Obviously, there are lots and lots of conversations that have been happening in the papers and online at the moment about kind of the status of um, black and minority ethnic um, citizens in the UK. But there have been big changes in the UK population. So what other changes have there been? While kind of going alongside that, so obviously I talked a little bit about kind of attitudes um, to race and things like that, there have been changes in societal attitudes. Um, and so I've got a couple of photos here for you. Um, so women's liberation marches, so what we might describe as sort of second wave feminism. So if we think of first wave feminism as the suffragettes and the suffragists, women trying to get the vote, um, what people kind of term second wave feminism generally means women trying to get certain legal rights. So things like equal pay, um, things like abortion rights. So having those kind of cornerstones of law that mean that you can't be discriminated against just because you're a woman. And we might also think of the civil rights movement, obviously very, very famous um, in America because of the segregation that black Americans faced. Um, but there were also civil rights movements in the UK, partially because of the changing population that we discussed in the previous slide. And also we might think about different attitudes in terms of attitudes to genders and to sexuality. So some key dates. Um, in 1967, abortion was legalised in 
in England. In 1969, there were the Stonewall riots in New York, and they led to the first Pride March later that year. And so really kind of fight for gay rights um, really began, kind of didn't begin then, um, but really sort of, I must guess, sort of built from there. Um, now, kind of, we're thinking specifically about sort of um, the gay population of the UK, um, and by that really I mean sort of LGBTQIA plus um, people, so a whole um, diverse group of people kind of within within that, and um, not all of whom would necessarily refer to themselves as as gay. Um, there were lots of fights um, in terms of attitudes. So Section 28 was repealed in 2003. Now, Section 28 essentially meant that in school teachers couldn't really talk to students about um, homosexuality. They were not allowed to promote homosexual values, um, which was obviously incredibly oppressive and damaging, um, both for teachers but also for pupils because they weren't they weren't learning um about um about lots and lots of different people and different sexualities um so that was repealed really really recently so some of these attitudes obviously the discussions began right at the beginning of this time period but they're still going on today and then in 2014 um, the first sort of gay marriages were legalised in the UK. So there are still lots and lots of fights for um, liberation for people who are discriminated against or face prejudice because of their race, because of their gender, because of their sexuality, um, because of all sorts of different things that um, might be not seen to be kind of the, the norm. And obviously there is there is really no no normal. Um, but even even being able to say that and kind of question what normal means is something that's really been a conversation that's been had by a greater sort of majority of society really quite recently. So we kind of looked at the population changing and attitudes changing and obviously that, that does impact who who we elect to govern us and what those people do, kind of thinking about Diane Abbott who I mentioned a little while ago. So let's look at some of those changes in UK politics. So after World War II, to give you a little bit of context, um, the UK was quite quite poor and um, there was lots of debts. Um, obviously, there had been lots of bombing and there were lots of soldiers coming back from war. Um, and this was seen as a really, really good time to set up the welfare state. So the government providing provisions for people so they could access basic human rights. So a big one, of course, being the NHS and universal free health care. So this wasn't something um, that happened on a sort of national scale before before that point. So you get lots of the things that we would sort of take for granted now being established in that period. Now, as I said, um, there were lots of sort of um, problems with the economy and also the UK kind of adapting to a changing global economy when competing against lots and lots of different countries. And a big kind of topic in right from the sort of 40s to the 80s was the unions. We've got a photo of a union here. And essentially unions are where workers in an industry band together um, to negotiate together for better rights. It might be safety, it might be greater pay, and um, to kind of improve their employment situation. Now this really, really took hold, especially in the 1970s. There were lots of unions fighting for what they saw as um, sort of better conditions for their workers. Now the contrasting view to this, um, one that kind of Margaret Thatcher definitely held, was that these unions were defending dying industries, industries that weren't competitive anymore, that weren't making money and were bound um, eventually to kind of die out. So Margaret Thatcher um, really kind of fought back against the unions and there's lots of things you can read about the kind of big strikes that went on, especially um, between the sort of miners um, in the 1980s. She also argued for a kind of broader and um, kind of international aspect um, from the UK. She wanted lots of kind of free trade to trade with um, 
have relatively few controls. And then she also, um, in, in her opinion, wanted to kind of empower people to live their lives how they wanted. So she wanted them to work hard. She didn't necessarily want the government to give them much financial support, but she also did things like um, allowing local governments to sell lots of um, council housing to council house residents. That meant people could own a home potentially for the first time. Uh, but then that did have consequences, of course, meaning that if other people needed a council house, that they'd been taken out of the kind of general pot because they'd been bought and were then privately owned. And so a really, really kind of important um, figure in shaping British politics. Um, while um, she was prime minister in the kind of late 1980s, you also get the Liberal Democrats um, being formed. So a political party that, you know, is seen as quite a mainstream one now, but only get formed in the light, late 1980s. And then Tony Blair took over as Labour leader in the mid 1990s and he was elected as Prime Minister in 1997. So he stood for what is kind of often termed new Labour and this was seen as a Labour that had kind of parted ways at least somewhat from the kind of associations with the unions and strikes of the 1970s and this was a Labour that wanted to encourage people to make money um, and continue some would say some of the value started um, by Margaret Thatcher but they also did things like really really heavily investing in education and um, furthering some of the kind of social rights um, of for example um, repealing Section 28, that we already talked about, and um, but also involving some things like the Iraq War. Um, now, kind of towards the end of um, Labour being in power, they stopped being in power in 2010, and the Conservative governments that we've had um, since. There are also lots of other parties that start to become quite influential. So the Scottish National Party, um, devolution of power to Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, and parties in those countries arguing that they should be independent, they shouldn't be ruled um, by Westminster, by London. And of course, the UK Independence Party, who argued to um, remove ourselves from the European Union. And so we had the Scottish referendum in 2014, um, which didn't go through. Scotland is still part of the UK and the EU referendum, which did pass. And so we have are in the process of leaving the EU. So different attitudes kind of developing. We have the welfare state. We have the power of the unions. We have increasing kind of opening up of the economy and international trade being important but we also have different kinds of nationalism um, and different factions in UK politics um, coming to the forefront in the kind of 2000s. So now looking at changes in global politics, obviously in 1945 there's the end of World War II which was a really obviously big event in global politics and then there are lots of different kind of key players here. So I'm just going to talk through some of the things that happened here. So I've got this image of America and the Soviet Union and the kind of really big dynamic in in geopolitics from sort of 1945 to about 1990 was this battle between the US standing for capitalism, potentially standing for um, democracy too versus the Soviet Union and the kind of communist view of society um, that they um, were promoting. Um, while the US and, and the Soviet Union, Soviet Union is sort of Russia and other, other countries near to Russia, and while they never fought themselves, they had lots of different um, proxy wars. So, for example, the Vietnam War that America were involved in, that was them sort of defending democracy and capitalism um, against the kind of red threat um, of the Soviet Union there. And the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 was kind of marked the end of the Soviet Union. Um, lots of countries that were part of the Soviet Union becoming um, sort of free democracies and opening up to um, sort of lots of kind of American values, American businesses, getting a McDonald's, um, getting all sorts of products um, and things that they hadn't had before then. Now during this period there is also um, the kind of end of the British Empire. So in 1945 there are still lots and lots of countries that have been colonised um, by the British Empire but lots of countries become independent, um, often really really fighting and um, quite sort of 
bloody rebellions and wars to gain their independence. Um, so we have India becoming independent, um, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and lots and lots of other countries um, sort of taking off the shackles of the British Empire. Um, and so Britain's place in sort of global politics potentially being challenged by the fact um, and became a lot a lot smaller, potentially a lot less influential and certainly a lot a lot less richer um, from kind of the money um, and goods and resources that we had kind of robbed from countries that were part of the empire. Now I've put here um, the bricks. Um, you can see some flags here, so you might be able to guess what the bricks stand for. I mean, these are nations that kind of are seen as up and coming. You might already say they've kind of they've come up. Um, and are increasingly influential on the global stage. Um, so that is Brazil, it's Russia, India, China and South Africa. Um, so kind of countries that are challenging the status quo of potentially the UK or America, it's very, very Western perspective of where power lies on a global stage. They become increasingly um, influential in the 1990s and onwards. And then in 2001, I've put 9-11, um, obviously the um, bombing of the Twin Towers really, really changed American foreign policy, it also changed the UK's foreign policy. And um, so you have things like Guantanamo Bay being set up, the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan, and this kind of focus of if we say that the Soviet Union was the kind of real focus of US foreign policy and kind of seen as a danger, and um, that starts to then get focused on the dangers of terrorism and sort of nations within the Middle East. And of course, for kind of British citizens, that means, unfortunately, things like a real rise in Islamophobia and some really kind of anti-immigration rhetoric that starts to rise because of this sort of perceived threat. <laughs> So kind of thinking about um, all the things that I've discussed, how does the world change between 1945 and 2020? Um, well, first of all, change doesn't happen in a straight line. We might look at the Race um, Relations Act and say, you know, racism was tackled, it was dealt with. But then if we look at the murder of George Floyd earlier this year, we can see that actually there's still a lot that needs to be done, both on a kind of individual level, but also in terms of what um, government and big, big forces within countries do about this. Um, so you might want to think about what events might be particularly important and think about whether they were important, whether there's things that have been missed out. You might want to think about, and um, for your text, do your text reference any of these events? Are there any of them that are particularly important for what you're reading? And also thinking about the author who wrote um, your, your plays, your poems, your novels, does their background give any clues to context that they might have thought of as particularly important? So finally, what to do next? Have a look at the themes that I've discussed. Um, I'm sure I've missed things out. What other important things happened in the last 75 years? Do they fit in with this theme? Do they fit into something else? Um, you might want to write your own timeline of these events to help you remember them. It can be quite confusing because lots and lots of different things happen, but this might help you keep track. Um, thinking about your, your text, think about key themes within the text that you're looking at. Could you find five historical events or contexts which might add weight to your analysis when you're talking about them? Um, I'd also suggest talking to adults that you know. Um, they'll have lived through at least some part of the last 75 years and it might be interesting getting their perspective on some of the events that I've discussed or asking them what they see as some of the real key events. There's also loads of things that you can read, watch and listen. Um, you could read history books, you could also read biographies or novels or watch films or listen to um, podcasts about this time period and they can all give you a better picture of the past um, but I would um, sort of urge you to remember, especially with things like biographies, novels and films, um, but also with historical books too, um, that they are presenting a certain version of the past, um, a certain perspective, a certain story that they want to create. Um, so they might say to you, this is the most important, just like I have, but just like me, they have their own perspective and their own viewpoint. And again, thinking back to the text that you study, you want to think about how their viewpoint interacts with all the events that happened in the last 75 years.